Dobry večer. Guten Abend. Good evening. Vítame vás srdečne v Goethe Institutu. Um, dnes večer mluvíme anglicky, ale máme překlad čeština a angličtina. So everybody who has who is in need of Czech translation should provide him or herself with one of our um, earphones. Warmly welcome to this discussion with Harald Welzer and Thomas Sedlacek. Um, we announced it as a kind of um, discussion, Welzer Sedlacek. This was it. Of course, there is a context for this meeting, and the context is something that I would like to attract your attention to. It's a project, Futur Perfect, Future Perfect. It's a project that the Goethe Institute is about to develop in now nearly 30 countries in the world. And today and tomorrow, we have a meeting here of representatives of this project from I think 26 or 27 cult uh, countries, 32, 32 actually, 32. not here, 26 from Pakistan to New Zealand, from Chile to Finland, from Canada to China. China. <laughs> <laughs> so our audience today is partly are the members of this project. And this project, what is it about? It's um, mainly internet-based project about storytelling, telling stories about a better future that already have begun here. So, as you see here, we are telling stories in different languages, of course. And we are telling these stories so that everybody can read them. Every story is told in its own language, but we are telling all the stories in English and German. So the idea is that we are bringing stories about a sustainable, better future, a future that has already begun in projects where we combine better ideas for sustainable futures with new ideas for social and economic collaboration. We do this in different languages, we do it from different countries, and we think it's worth jumping from one story to the next, learning from one story to the other, sharing the stories and sharing the experience of change, which is now the context that we have chosen also for this discussion. We don't want to talk about anything. We want to talk about change. We want to talk about transformation. We want to talk about development, progress, all these concepts. So the question that we would try to ask, and maybe to answer in a way, is how does change, evolution, and development comes to the world? Do I have to present Tomas Sedlacek in his hometown? He's one of the leading European public intellectuals, maybe the most important voice of his generation from the Czech Republic. He is a world success with his book from, I think, 2011, Economy of the Good and Evil. Yes. Very important translation and very successful translation to German too, to other languages, of course. He recently has, as a scholar, but also as a public intellectual, as a blogger, as a participant in various debates, has delivered a new book last year, this, it was last year, 2015, yeah. Yeah. already translated uh, to German and uh, I think only, only, German. only to German, <laughs> um, which is an interesting thing. It's, um, um, I only know the German title, Lilith und die Dämonen des Kapitals, which is a kind of psychoanalysis of capitalism. So he yeah. puts capitalism- Ka Kind on, of is the most important yeah. word in that sentence. Puts capitalism <laughs> on the couch. Yes. And um, okay, so it's it's the 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 encounter of 
two interesting paradigms, if you want three interesting paradigms, it's, uh, it's also strongly related to the world of Greek myth, mythology, and so forth. Glad to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the nice thing about introductions is that they only say the, the good things about you. <laughs> okay, this will change now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Harald Welzer, coming from Berlin, is a scholar, sociologist, social psychologist, and in his first career... Botschafter. Willkommen, Herr Botschafter. In his... Early career, he was uh, a professor and um, entered the German debate with quite important research on violence, memory, and related issues. So, so social psychology in a general attempt, but related to German history and events on, and the European history of violence of the 20th century. Then the next very important point was um, climate change and the social and political impact of climate change, which, which shifted the German debate on climate change to the more social and political aspects. For quite a while, he has left academic life in a 100% in a job perspective. He is a public intellectual and is publishing, is debating, he's an activist, and he is a director of the Project Futur 2. Actually, this is a project that has inspired our project Future Perfect. It's a German web page telling stories in the sense that I described it for Future Perfect. And the mere idea, the simple idea, and the simple idea of our collaboration is let's transfer the idea of Futur 2 to an international <coughs> global level. And we are happy to do important steps right now on this way. And now to the mean things, please. <laughs> <laughs> no? So I'm going to join you now on the stage. <laughs> During the communist regime, uh, you know, everybody had to perform so-called uh, self-criticism. Self-criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Transformation, change, development. It's a concept of learning societies, maybe. The other way round, the question is what drives history? Or how can or should history be driven if we want, we want to change something? If it's not by accident, which is the Schabowski model. You know, Schabowski, Günter Schabowski, uh, some 26 years ago, and uh, afternoon of the November 9th, 1989, announced more or less by accident that the German, the Berlin Wall would be open. Um, if it's not by accident, what is running and what is driving history? Asking an economist, is it economy? We have so many explanations. We have the phenomenon of globalization and maybe one of the last big concepts that is trying to cope with this huge phenomenon is a concept of capitalism, is um, a tradition of more or less Marxist theories, coming from the idea that there is a kind of economic process, and this process sooner or later comes into contradiction to class systems, to class uh, societies, and this creates a moment of crisis and then by yeah. revolutionary steps, we have change. Um, even in a vaster sense, um, I, just to quote Bill Clinton, it's the economy stupid. Yeah. Is it the economy? Well, I think it's rather it's the stupid economy. <laughs> that is the way the, the slogan has changed because we have thought that uh, that economy is the embodiment of reason and in fact both the Marxist theory who expect the economic base to be the driving factor of human behavior, so change the, change the uh, economic settings and human nature will change. So it, that is the driving element of, of capitalist logic, but it's all uh, so a communist or Marxist rather. 
logic. But as you pointed out, really, I was trying to look for the quote because there's nothing better than to, you know, suck up directly at the beginning with a with a quote, you know. But I I I'm, I failed to find it. But you have this one point where you say that it's this is an irony of history, which happens very often, that in this the extremes meet. It is not only Marxism that believes that economic drivers are the key drivers in, in, in human history, but also the rational choice theory. So today, we sort of believe it is our ideology that it is the markets who lead us into the future. What are the markets saying? This is a guesswork that every politician wants, has to do will, willy-nilly, as they say nicely in English now, in Czech, that's volky ne volky, <laughs> willy-nilly. I don't know how that sounds in, in German. Whether you like it or not, the markets are saying something. We have these priests who interpret the whims, the psychology of the market. But nevertheless, we, at the end of the day, we revert to psychology, psychoanalysis. So for example, we say that the economy is depressed. So that is, of course, uh, a psychiatric or psychological terminology to which I always say, well, you know, it's not depressed, that's the wrong diagnosis. The economy, if anything, is manic depressed. You know, it suffers from bipolar, bipolar excesses and I tend to fear more the manic stages rather than the depressing stages. So the interesting things about the markets leading us into the future is this is something that Sarkozy mentioned and also uh, Bill Clinton when they became the supreme sovereign leaders of a sovereign democratic country. Uh, you know, after a couple of days of being in the office, they came back to their advisors and they said, I have zero degrees of freedom. I have to do what the markets want me to do. Otherwise, the whole, the whole system, system collapses. So we are, in a way, believing that we are led by what I call unorchestrated orchestrator. This is a meaner or a little bit more nastier name for the invisible hand of the market. But the point with the future is important here. You mustn't orchestrate it. Laissez faire, laissez passer, let it be, let it work. It will orchestrate you. So it's this debate whether economics is normative or positive. I, I'd like to add that economics is normative backwards. It gives you norms. It shows you where value is. And it, in a way, leads us into the future. And then an irrational uh, wave of migrant crisis happens, which could result in historic events that by far suppress any debate whether the GDP growth is 2 or 4%. And also mark that the refugee crisis, or whatever you want to call it, would be equal even if we had 20% of GDP growth. So that's my uh, thoughts. Shortly before we enter the refugee crisis uh, issue, we surely will. Um, maybe another question or just a question coming from your normative idea of economies. I think it's your, maybe one of the key arguments of your book is that economy is culture, is part of yep. a wider concept that we can call culture or yep. however. Culture means long-term development. Culture means slower ways of transition. Um, we are in a country here, we, we have, we have the, 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 the expression of transformation countries for the former Soviet communist countries, mm -hmm. where we talk about, we had Kurt Biedenkopf here, German politician, talking about Saxonia, talking it's a generational project. Change needs time. Yep. So Harald, is it culture? that drives history? Is it culture in the way of clashes of civilizations, of cultures, of mutual contradictory effects of incorporation and rejection? Is it culture? Now, as long as we talk about humans and about societies or groups of humans, we cannot talk about anything other than, than about culture because the human life form is one that developed something which we call culture, but this is the design of the natural circumstances that they live in. No other beings do this in a way, and we live not only under natural given conditions, 
but also under historical and cultural giving conditions. And this is something quite interesting because um, economics, for example, tend to naturalize given circumstances and say, this is the market and these are the rules of the markets and humans are greedy and they are like this. And this is all complete bullshit because people are like the given societal circumstances and the cultural circumstances that are, they are living in and they were born in. And this is very, very different in terms of history because people in this very same area or very same city 300 years ago had a complete different mindset and mentality. So there's nothing natural about human mindsets except the natural basis, the organic basis that we all, or some of us have brains and so, um, and the body and all these things. But what we are thinking about, which concepts we develop, how we perceive the outside world, how we perceive the others, is all cultural, inevitably cultural. And this means it can be transformed and it is transformed constantly. So the question of societal change is not a question if there is a stable phase and then suddenly comes change and then stability. I think it's wrong. It's everything is changing constantly and there are different drivers for this change. One driver is social movement. We had the major changes in the 20th century because of social movements. We have technical inventions as drivers for something. We have, of course, power, accumulation of power, interests, whatever, and um, maybe for just a very, very, very small amount, ideas. Concepts. Concepts. So um, this is, and, and, and for some amount, of course, natural disasters that happen and change things like the pest or, um, you know, things like that, earthquakes, whatever, things like that have also triggering social developments. So the content... But I wanted, I wanted to, to add something to what Thomas said. Um, about the, the, the guys from the economics. And, uh, and I just wanted to add that they are even profits backward. Yeah? So, yeah. Because, because I found it really interesting as somebody who has no idea about this discipline that during the economic crisis, the German uh, um, economists wouldn't make any prognosis anymore. So this is what they do every quarter of the year and say, oh, we will have a growth rate of 3.6 or something like this. And in 2008, they made the decision not to make prognosis anymore because the situation had changed and they felt incapable. And I think this was a total bankrupt in terms of the scientific discipline because if they are only able to make prognosis under normal conditions, so what it's worthwhile because everybody could do this. Okay, we will grow or something and then something happens and then they say, okay, we come back five years later or something when we see what happened. Yeah. So they are backward <laughs> profits. But of course, we have this lovely idea of modern politics that means given that social change and change is automatically there, there is no such thing as a stable society, stability doesn't exist. We had the lovely idea, maybe an idealistic concept of from time to time, intentionally try to influence what's going on. So we have a non-intentional, non-intended kind of development and change, and we have the idea, for example, the, the well-known post-totalitarian liberal idea of the open society, piecemeal engineering, trial and error. We have a framework of democratic institutions. We have debates, we have uh, um, parliaments, and finally we have decisions that lead us to a human-controlled type of piecemeal change. Would that be enough for the world in which we are living nowadays? Question to both of you. Well, you know, there's a wonderful quote 
uh, that we live in the condition of um, Stone Age emotions at best. Those would be the developed ones. Uh, uh, medieval ideologies of, of politics and, and church and godlike technology. And, and this combination is what we are, what we are uh, you know, trying to, trying to deal with. And um, yeah, the, 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 funny, the fun part, if I, may, if I may pick on where, where, where you sort of um, left it, uh, I don't know if anybody from here was on the debate last week that I had with Mr. Tomsky. It was supposed to be, nobody? It was supposed to be about <laughs> Brexit, but it ended up being about ideology, in fact. Because he, he did a trick that economists do very often. He said, you know, this British stance is a pragmatic, reasonable, rational, non-ideological stance, whereas, you know, the rest of Europe, meaning the continental Europe, is ideology. I said, well, you know, OK, fine. So, uh, so everything else is ideology except for what you believe. Um, <laughs> And he said, yes, 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 because it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's pragmatic. And I said, well, pragmatism is an ideology like any, any other. It just ignores. And he says, what's, what's, what's ideological about 2 plus 2 equals 4? I said, well, ideological is that you only see the 2 plus 2 equals 4. And you delete what effects that addition itself might have on the other part of the globe. Part of ideology is what you are adding. Are you adding human beings? Are you adding Jews? Or are you adding apples? You know, you can feel immediately that the, that the context of, of the pragmatic uh, veil of ignorance um, uh, appears. So, so, the, so the, my question here is, and that was also a question to him, whether he believes that such a thing as ideologically neutral ground exists, whether you can exit ideology. Of course, my position is that it is impossible, that you always have to exchange one ideology for another. But what economists, I think, have, and I'm an economist as well, this is why I'm so critical towards economists. If I'd be a sociologist, I'd be critical of sociology. If I'd be a philosopher, I'd make fun of philosophy, but I'm not. I respect philosophy, and I respect sociology, and I make fun of economics. This is an exactly opposite method from what most of my colleagues choose. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, the, 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 the ideological sort of step here was that we have created a neutral, zero ideological ground, which we accidentally also occupied. This level of zero ideology is us. Economists, you can see it very nicely in Czech politics. We are, and I won't bother you for long with that, it's a very sad story, but we've been <laughs> electing businessmen or business people who, uh, who, have, uh, who have systematically no system and, who ha and their program is no program and their ideology is no, no ideology, which of course is you are embedded in ideology the most the moment, the moment, because it's a home run of every ideology is to pretend like this is the holy truth. And, and who believes that he isn't or she isn't embedded in ideology uh, is embedded in it the most. So just a small little warning against so that this, this economic pragmatism, this make-believe that there is no ideology, that what we are offering is a neutral, ideologic, non-ideological ground from which other ideologies can be judged is the most ideological, of course, thing of all. I, even I would say that economics has become perhaps the most ecumenic religion of the whole world. It's something that we all, it's a language that we all talk, it's an ideology in which we, in which we, in which we all uh, believe. <clears throat> so, yeah, you talked about the, the <laughs> you know, questions are uh, for beginners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all will leave as. But I'm sure in some way I answered it. <laughs> we, we all will leave, leave at advance. Harald, some some interesting points for a social psychologist. That he mentioned. I mean, the 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 the, um, the Stone Age 
um, psychology and basics, how we, emotional and, 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 and God-like like technology. And Sorry. on God the other like hand, technology. on the other, you mentioned before that there is, even if it's a very small and exclusive um, path, that we could eventually change and influence our destiny by, let's say, concept, vision, debate, the Habermasian way. Now, How I, does I, both fit together? I don't, I don't believe in the Habermasian way because this is an over-intellectual concept because uh, the idea is that we meet under circumstances without any power, again, without any ide ideology, and then start discussing the best ways. I mean, this is an ideal concept, and what is true in it, to my opinion, is that we have no other chance than building relationships and have conversations inside these relationships. This is the only thing, but then all these other variables intervene into this situation. But um, I, I think, if, if we have these kind of single issue ideologies, like the market is regulating everything, or people are egoistic and follow only their profit uh, uh, needs or something like this, this is always wrong. And this is absolutely true, what I say now, and it's completely non-ideological, of course. Uh, because humans, are never monothematic, and they have never a single reason to do something. But they are always in constellations, in figurations of other people, in figurations of people that are close to them, in figurations of people that are far away from them, in figurations that build up a whole society and a history that is the basis of this society. So we are always part of these type of figurations that influence or that make our decisions, and there's never a single issue. If we look backward on what happened, people are always motivated to find one single reason why they did this or that. But in a concrete, actual situation, there's never a single reason. I mean, there's not even a single reason that we sit here, because there are many, many reasons. Yeah? The one is that Berthold invited us to this. The other thing is that maybe we like to perform in public. The other thing is uh, maybe we had nothing better to do tonight. Um, so the many, many... And, and it's a, we get, a, of course, a fucking hell of money for and this check, And <laughs> check beer, check beer. Don't <laughs> underestimate the power of the most important you know, thing, of course. So, so there's never, as long as we talk about social beings, and humans are social beings, we have never such a thing as a monothematic issue and never a monothematic topic. And there are always the same thing is that we cannot interpret things that happen on a monocausal basis. There's never a single reason for anything that is going yeah. to happen. And I think this is quite important to understand what people do and why they do things, because there are, of course, always perceptions that are very situationally based. What do I have to do now? What is the requirement? I think about what is the requirement now in the situation. The requirement is that you expect something like an intellectual debate. And uh, we have to fulfill this expectancy that we expect that you expect this from us. So this is a perfect relationship we have. And we all try to fulfill this relationship. So everybody in this room has the quality of a variable to define the situation. So, and there I don't was know light. who did this. Um, okay. <laughs> Nothing is predictable. <laughs> so, but, but I think, and then there's always this kind of misconception that certain disciplines have the approach to social developments or social circumstances to identify these causal relationships. There was first this and second this happened, therefore we can foresee what will happen next. And this is totally wrong. Yep. Yeah? So because I don't know if this was an answer to the question, but <laughs> I think, it's I think our we will understand each other. <laughs> <laughs>
but but no, now I have an answer to your question. I would say I would say uh, that even predicting the past is extremely difficult. Right. Because because what factors were the deciding factors? I was reading this book about the the, the, the advent of, of Nazism, especially especially in Germany. And and you don't know. You I mean what I found most striking, one of one of the things in your book is that most of the life was normal. It wasn't all Olympics and and, and you know rallies with soldiers. Most of your days were, you know, going to school, having debates like this, and it slowly somehow changed and then there was war. So so I think even explaining the history, predicting backwards is not as easy as it as it um, seems, I would have one comment to it. You know, you never know until you know too much, and then it's usually too late. <laughs> and and these things happen in your personal life. You don't know where it started, but somehow, when the moment when you notice it, it's usually, I would say, too late. And one more comment is if you if you read. As you all do, of course, you know, intellectuals in the history of mankind, the, the history never, this is one hope that we have, history never or usually never um, Cares evolves, about intellectuals. Yeah, evolves yes. the way the intellectuals fear it. <laughs> you know, so one of the reasons why everybody, this, you know, again, it sounds really funny today. Ten years ago, everybody was afraid of, of bricks. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I said, you know, one reason why I don't care about bricks is because all the intellectuals seem to think that that they will rule the world. And as you can see, uh, so whatever there's a, there is already a, a, a shed light on there, it, it usually goes, goes the other, other way around. On the other hand, we do have reasons for hope. And the Green, green Movement is, for example, a great, uh, great um, example of that. 20 years ago, who would have thought that the Green Movement would be this successful? 20 years ago, if I may so say so, it was a joke. It was yes, a couple it, of It's 1.4% in the Czech Republic. Yeah, and it's a very serious political force. Nobody makes fun of the Greens anymore. It's a very serious business force. Companies are required either from external or I would even say internal compulsions to actually behave. They are aware of it. We simply were not aware. We, we didn't realize that, you know, washing our cars in the rivers, that there is anything <laughs> wrong about it. And, and it's even a personal strong force. You know, even if you could without anybody watching you, you wouldn't really wash your car in the river. I mean, even if, 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 if there would be no social consequences, it's sim like you brush your teeth, even if nobody's watching. Huh? Do you share this optimism or this um, this idea about social movements and especially the green movement? Yeah, in principle, I, I share this. I mean, I have some criticism about the development of the green movement in Germany uh, because they made some kind of you know collaborating with pure capitalism, if you want. So there's this thing of green capitalism now, yeah. where you change the world and save the world by yeah making money uh, yeah. on the green market yeah. and uh, green market has to grow and things like that. So this is, to my opinion, totally misleading. Yeah. So this happened, but of course I have great sympathy for the whole ecological yeah. movement in itself. But as in everything, everything in life, it can develop better or worse. I mean, same with the green movement. Yeah. So. There's this beautiful schizophrenia that you talk, talk about in one of your lectures, that there is a, there's an irony that we are becoming more ecologically aware. This example with the coffee yes. machines, if I may, yes. that you know, 10 years ago, maybe you should say, 20 years ago, you come to a shop and there were two coffee machines. Now you come to a shop and there's 200 coffee machines. While we are all you know, cognitively aware that we don't need 200 machines and that we should scale down, there is this sort of, if I understood you correctly. Yeah, but this is, and this is really important because it's not so easy to understand. As coming from Germany or other uh, of these beautiful green society yes. who have the self-perception. I mean, as a personal example, uh, I am the perfect example, not for schizophrenia, but for the parallelity of dif different developments. When I was 
A, a Konfirmandenschüler, what is it? Um, about, for, about 14 years old. Yeah, 13 years old or something like this. I did my first longer work, you know, uh, something that we had to write and so, and I choose the topic environmental disaster. So this is some decades ago. Yeah? And I wrote this paper and was completely shocked about all these things that people would do to the environment and had the, the urge we have to save the world. So, and somehow I kept during my bi autobiography to this thing because this was always part of my political concern, but not so intensely sometimes, but sometimes it was. So w one could say, this guy developed a certain kind of consciousness at a certain age, and he is a green by heart, something like this. And he's an activist and whatever. But it, with the same 40 years that happened in the meantime, my overuse of resources or my amount of use of everything, like nature capital, like uh, fossil fuels, like so, everything was, my consciousness was heightened and my material use was heightened in the same amount. And this is true for our societies. Yeah? So there's a complete mismatch between awareness or consciousness and the practical things we do. So one could make the, the somehow cynic relationship that the greener a society is, the more uh, awful is its uh, carbon footprint. This is a bad relationship, yeah? And, and people think, I mean, the problem is solved as long as they think they are green, that they are already doing something, because this makes then the opportunity to do practically yeah. the complete opposite, yeah. because they don't have to feel guilty. And they think, okay, this is fine. The only problem that is left, we have to tell all these other people in the emerging countries that they don't have to do all these failures yeah. that we yeah. did, but we continue to do these failures yeah. all the time. It's, it's uh, if I may, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 even the guilt gets commercialized, right. if, if you take my meaning. So this is the nice, nice thing about consumer ideology. Let's see how, how I, let me try to demonstrate what I mean by the example of drinking Coca-Cola, for example. Yeah, so when you drink Coca-Cola, this is my, this is my uh, exercise for you as a homework next time you're drinking Coca-Cola. Try to imagine that you are in, in medieval times. In other words, try to taste Coke as if you've only tasted milk, wine, beer, and water in your life, nothing else. You've never drunk anything else. And now suddenly you're tasting this, 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 this drink called, called Coca-Cola. So if you can try to get rid of the ideology, of, because when you drink Coca-Cola, you're also drinking American pop culture, which makes you feel, in a way, a little bit cool, a little bit young, a little bit fresh, but also a little bit too McDonald's and too, too corporate. The color is black. We don't have similar uh, hatred towards Fanta, <laughs> for example, because I think the color, you know, uh, it's just, it's, it's dark. It's, 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 it's sort of, um, uh, so, so that's part of the ideology as well. It's fresh, it's cold, and you also get guilt because it's not healthy. Healthy is also you know, another cult that we, that we really b believe in. So you are already drinking not just ideology of, of whatever I described, you are also drinking guilt. Now, guilt, you know, is a primer religious building block. Where would religions be without guilt? And you know, I'm not saying this as a bad thing. I myself am a believer. That's another ideology to which I subscribe, like I subscribe to capitalism as an ideology that I am aware that I believe. I'm not very happy with it, but I have nothing better to believe. I can't step out of, uh, of, of, of that ideology, even though sometimes I would wish. Um, but you can, you can, of course, uh, buy Diet Coke. So. That moral blame is somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, commercialized. You can also say, Slavoj Žižek says this, that, that uh, this, it's, it's an indulgence, odpustek. 
that you, this free trade, the problem with free trade, like perhaps with the other, uh, with ecological concerns is, the problem might be that the general population gets an impression that that's enough, you know? So uh, yes, I am buying, I don't know what, coffee. I know that I'm participating in destruction of local farmers somewhere, I don't know where, I don't even know where. So, but 99.9% .9 I do it, but 1% I give back. And it makes me feel that that's, in a way, enough. So you could, you could perfectly liken that, I think. It would be an interesting research um, to, to medieval Catholic um, indulgences. Talking about Catholicism, my last comment, I think the situation today is a little bit like in medieval times, when nobody really believed the, in the Catholic way anymore, but we don't have Luther. We don't have John Huss, we don't have anybody who will, could offer a, a better, better uh, or newer ideology. So we believe it, nevertheless. We don't want to believe it, but we believe it. Like nobody really believes in vampires, but you know, when the night is, <laughs> when the night is full and you're walking through a graveyard and you just saw a really good vampire movie, you're not so sure. You, know, <laughs> you don't want to believe it, but in a way, you do. So you seek light, and you seek the company of people, then you laugh about it, and that laugh brings you a much needed relief. Which way out? Uh, I mean, we have this iron cage of a wonderfully functioning capitalism. Uh, being myself a sociologist, I would refer to, to, to the barbarian concepts of uh, authority, mm -hmm. three types of authority. We have the rational, legal, bureaucratical way of governing, and we have this uh, wonderful functioning market and system that even exploits your emotions and perfectly serves to your needs if it's Coca-Cola, if it's vampire movies or whatever you need to feel good in this world. Um, could it be a new type of charismatic authority? Um, let's talk about, uh, let's leave the Eurocentric perspective. We, we have been talking about the Asian model, or the Singapore model, guided democracies. You got guided democracy, Singapore model is now guided democracy. Uh, it's, it's a guided thing. Oh, I like that, guided democracy, okay. <laughs> no, no, I agree. It's Something like that. <laughs> so the idea of, of to come out of this, of this iron cage of bureaucratic authority, right, right, right. we need charismatic leaders. I mean, from the type from Pope Francisco to Donald Trump, we have different offers. Do we need other leaders? Do we need other people that inspire us? Uh, definitely not, um, because it's not the question of leaders who pop up and have brilliant ideas and convincing rhetorics and whatever. Uh, because if you look at this historically, uh, you will always have leaders who had their chance in certain circumstances again. So it's not just by accident that somebody becomes prominent, important, powerful at a certain point of time. And I think taking, if we take Donald Trump, somebody like this would have been completely impossible 20 years ago. So this says something about a development in the political sphere that goes much more into kind of pop culture, talk show things, and all this is mistaken with politics. So this is an example for this. So, and I think societal change doesn't come from singular persons. Maybe they, they incorporate something. Maybe there are persons who can formulate certain arguments and bring them convincingly, but there must be something in, um, in groups of people that, that have a tendency to, to move towards change. And the driver for this is always a feeling of, and I think this is something that is relatively constant in history, that the, the major driver is always a feeling of injustice, of something that is wrong. People still have something like an intuitive belief yep. what is wrong and what is okay. Yep. 
how people are treated. And it was always, with any kind of social movement, this was the underlying motive. And I think it's very important to, to, uh, to, rem to remind us of this, because the, the, the trigger that something is going on is always the difference between groups that are extremely privileged and groups that are underprivileged. And the, 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 the starting point of a social movement is always to mention this and to start to reclaim something that we want be not so underprivileged as we are now. And then something is going to happen without, of course, a definite ending or what. Many of these things fail, but this is the thing. What we, we cannot think of any kind of only intellectually motivated social change. And this is the failure of all the discussions about climate change because climate researchers have the idea they deliver the data and people change their behavior. But we don't act upon data. None of us does. We act upon... Ideology. Ideo no, not even ideology. We, the most of the things we do is because we want to be liked or loved by somebody. Social we want to make a certain kind of impression to be a nice guy and then somebody would do something for us or whatever. So there's never a data-based, I mean, except maybe scientists have this idea and sometimes do, but I think most times they do. That's the reason why all the climate researchers fly more than any other people in the world. So, it's the same relations. Yeah. They don't act upon the data they provide by themselves. This yeah. is very interesting. So, if we think about social change, we have to look at other sources for yeah. social change. Interesting point. These sources might be some kind of universal idea of fairness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like John Rawls put it in a way. Yeah. Uh, this is a true resource. Yeah. Well, you can see it in a child. Uh, the first objection that a child has, so with a child, of course, we have an example of mm, undoctrinated or perhaps something that's not so trained in, in education and rationality or whatever. This is the most common complaints of the kids. It's not fair. You know, that's basically, you get that being a parent or being close to these, I call them, you know, Übermensch. Uh, <laughs> No, because, you know, Nietzsche had this prophecy about the age of a child, and he also talked about Übermensch, which in English you translate as, you know how you know how to translate Übermensch in English? Superman, yes. And the first uh, cartoon of Superman, do you know when that was issued? 36. You know, no, needs, no need to explain that fictional fight of, of ideology on a fictional level, but nevertheless, um, he predicted the advent of, 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 of Übermensch, and he said those would be outside of good and evil, they would be not possessed by sexuality or by rationality, as adults are. Um, they will have a legion of slaves around them, and they will, you know, just dance around and, 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 and no, longer, no longer wage wars. And I, and I think he, 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 he missed the point that these Übermensch already exist, and they're children. And the legion of slaves working for them <laughs> day and night for a reason that we can't really explain, that's us, you know, of course. And, and coming back to fairness, I always say it's fair. Every adult is a leftover from a child. You know, so we've all we've all been there. We can't complain now. Our and also the the economic logic there, and I think this is perhaps a good example of how the society is structured in a stable way, which isn't really economically rational, or well, it is rational, but it isn't um, quit for quote. It isn't an exact exchange. The biggest transaction in the history of mankind is one that isn't even recorded in any. Think, and that's a transaction between adults and children. We don't even know how much money goes in that direction, but it's a, it's a trade. I give money to my child, and he gives me, economically speaking, what in return? A painting of very mediocre quality <laughs> uh, for, for Christmas and birthdays, if I'm lucky, you know. 
but I can't really go to the market and I can't really, you know, sell it. Not that I would want to, but, you know, let's just imagine we run out of money. So this would be the last thing that you would, you know, sell. And, and so the deal, what is the deal? I'm giving you all the money. What are you giving me in return? Nothing. The deal is you will return it not to me, but to your children. And that is an unenforceable, implicit contract, which is more valuable than contracts signed in, in Maastricht or, or with, with blood. And yet it holds, that's why we are here. Um, now, is that, a rational, uh, is that a rational contract? Is it an irrational contract? It, it's, it's, really, it's really, really difficult. Um, Difficult to say. But anyway, going back to, and I always have to, you know, you see. I'm, uh, yeah, well, the charismatic leaders. <laughs> that's, um, that's, the only leader that we have today is Angela Merkel. I don't really know if you can call her, I like her personally, but I wouldn't go as far as to call her Charismatic, charismatic, right? No. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, she is, I think, the only leader uh, in Europe that we, I mean, imagine what would we do in this situation of four crises sort of happening at the same time without Angela Merkel. I mean, we have, we have I, I think she isn't really a good representative of a post-national leader. I think a good representative of a post-national leader is uh, Holland, and now excuse, I'm very much, but, but, that, but Holland is a good example of, of, of a modern politician, completely irrelevant. That is, no, I mean, with all due respect, that is the situation of all other leaders in Europe. If, 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 if you, what other leader, political leader, has said anything of relevance in the last two years, except for, nah, we don't like that. And what other leader has had any other concern except for his or her national political constituency? So Britons are all obsessed about Britain. Italians are all obsessed about Italy. France are all obsessed about France. The Czechs are all obsessed about Czechs. And the only exception, that's why I'm saying that she's not a good representative of a typical leader because she is in this way an outlayer, uh, and she's absolutely non-charismatic, and yet it, 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 it works. She has made it into a wonderful, wonderful quality. Again, assuming that a big part of the audience is Czechs, I, let me just give one small example from Czech politics. We had very charismatic leaders uh, two generations ago. We, we had Jiří Parobek and Topolánek, those were two alpha males, extremely charismatic. They're gone, and now we have the current prime minister, who, you know, is everything but charismatic. <laughs> and the leader of the opposition party, um, Professor Fiala, is also everything but, but, but charismatic. Let me close with a, with a provoking and a disturbing thought, and I would really like to know your opinion about this. I have no, this is just a thought. Most of my thoughts, by the way, are just thoughts. They're not claims. Somebody said a week ago, I don't agree with some of the things that you said. And I said, well, <laughs> nor do I. You know, uh, I, I hope I'm not an idiot who agrees with everything that he says. Uh, but uh, uh, man, is a, man is, you know, talking about capitalism and schizophrenia, uh, we should also mention thousand plateaus. I, I know this is a German culture institute, but it was, now that I was making fun of, uh, fun of the French uh, president, for which I apologize, it wasn't meant in any way. Um, I could pick anybody else. But, but uh, Deleuze and Gattari, they talked about uh, you know, thousand plateaus. And I, and I believe that uh, mankind is not one belief, but thousand simultaneous beliefs happening at the same time. So you can be both charismatic, fundamental Christian or Muslim believer while being a 100% you know, scientist. This is something that should no longer, should no longer surprise us. These two elements coincide in the, in the brain absolutely. Well, you can see this nicely in advertisement. So, so let's 
pick a stupid example. One advertisement advertises a good mother. So Monday morning, the whole family is waking up and the sunshine outside and your husband's already shaved when he kisses you in the morning and the kids are looking forward to going to school and the sun is shining. And if you, as a housewife, cannot reproduce this, and it's easy, it's enough just to buy Yogo Bella yogurt and that situation is, if you can't do it, you are stupid, irresponsible, uh, selfish, uh, everything but a, a mother. Advertisement number one, snap. Advertisement number two, sexy underwear, dancing in clubs, even if you have your period. I'm choosing these very brutal examples. Again, we see it in TV every day. These are conflicting, uh, conflicting, um, um, how should I put it? Yeah, conflicting plateaus. They cannot exist both at the same time. You can't, you can't comply with both of these super ego tasks. You can't be both at the same time, but you don't realize it. Even though it happens in the second, you don't realize it. Or take, think about the TV channels. The one that you're watching is only one of 30. They're all going simultaneously. In one, you see children suffering through war. In other, you see football. In the third, you see, I don't know what, erotic movie. In the fourth, you see a political debate. This is all happening at the same time, I would claim, in the same brain. And we switch between these layers of belief like we switch through TV channels. And my question. My question is this. This was a debate that I had with Mr. Komarek, who is a, who is a Czech biologist and a, and a very interesting thinker and philosopher, Stanislav Komarek. And uh, he published a book. And in it, in it, he says an interesting thought. He says, perhaps populism isn't lack of democracy, but excess of democracy. That populism is catering to the most libidal primer desires of mankind. It's too much giving the people what they want to hear. This is, this is what we criticize the populace. Oh, you're just saying this because people want to hear this. Yeah, well, yeah. That's actually, sorry to say, legitimate. That's one way how to understand the narrow understanding of democracy is that your elected uh, uh, representative should actually do what you want him or her to do. So this is perhaps, and again, it's an open question. I'm not sure, but it would nicely fit with economics, that the problem of economics, the problem of capitalism, is not lack of capitalism or lack of economics, but it's an excess thereof. Um, we are afraid of political populism, and we should be, because it's dangerous exactly because it can be legitimately established while becoming drastically evil, and we have examples of that from the history. But we don't talk about economic populism. So uh, let's, let's, let's see. So in democracy, in populism, what is it that we fear? Do we fear the charismatic leaders themselves? No. We fear that these charismatic leaders are able to cater to the lower uh, desires, the uncultured <laughs> desires of uh, the population too readily. In other words, legitimizing something that we in ourselves do not legitimize. So in open societies, we would have to pay the price of this kind of populism? No, no, because this is a, is a certain developmental stage of re, uh, really existing democracies. But this type of democracy we have now is, of course, different from the democracy that was developed in the 19th century or something like this, because the public sphere was something totally different. Um, the idea that th there should be a representative democracy is a relatively late stage in the development of democratic thinking and theory. And this is something that worked in the democratic societies for a long time very well. And for the simple reason that this is something like, uh, like making uh, um, um, the fulfillment of immediate needs 
slower and to build something yes. like an in-between sphere, a parliament says, okay, we have to debate about these yeah. things, while this idea of a direct democracy has this kind of infantile uh, idea that as soon as somebody is feeling the need of something, it has to be fulfilled. And this is now the idea of European politicians, uh, especially in the refugee issue, as a total stupid idea that people get concerned because they're coming refugees to Europe. And then there's the idea that this has to be solved immediately. And if politicians cannot solve it, we have a breakdown of democracy and things like that. So this is complete infantilization of politics, of society, of democracy, and whatever. So this is really a problem. And there's another aspect that, is, um, that I'm thinking about is the role that digitalization plays in this thing as, a, as an accelerator of these ideas. Because the promise of all these, these digital companies and all these digi digital ideologies is we solve every problem. There is no problem that we cannot solve. And we solve even your individual problems yeah. with our beautiful smartphones, <coughs> algorithms, apps, and whatever. So, and this is the whole acceleration of consumerist society, because this is about, oh, I feel urged to have a Coca-Cola, and tong, there's the Coca-Cola. Yeah? And the digitalization does it even faster, because the idea is that you have the Coca-Cola before. before you have ever had the idea to want the Coca-Cola. <laughs> this, this is what Jeff Bezos from Amazon wants to, to, uh, to achieve, that we get the goods before we ever had the, yeah. the, the yeah. feeling that we yeah. want to have it. Yeah. So, but this is then, coming back to the democracy issue, a complete opposite concept, because this is not about decision-making of humans who are able to think, who are educated in some way, who can reason about this and that, who can discuss things, but it's complete fulfillment of simple individual needs that are implemented in the minds of the people. Yeah, so we can skip the, the loop of advertising and then the person finally wants it and then you sell it to him. And li like you call it uh, guided democracy, this would be guided consumerism. Yes, and <laughs> if you read, and I did this uh, during the last year, if you read the textbooks of all these Eric Schmitz from Google and Peter Thiel and all these guys who are the, the pop stars of the digital scene, and if they are uh, invited by a European Tusk, politician, yeah. Yeah, these we politicians, must. the German uh, um, Minister for Economy, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, would sit there and say, oh God, this is so incredibly good, what Eric Schmidt says. But what Eric Schmidt says is something like a totalitarian concept that has nothing to do with democracy, but has in mind this idea how to bring all kinds of goods to the people and how to prevent them from thinking for just a second, something like this. This is the basic concept. But this is what they write in their books. This is kind, kind of interest because the concept of politics that they have is that politicians have to deliver. And this is what politicians are. They are experts for this and that. And if they don't deliver, you can throw them out. And this is also the idea, and this is a fascist idea, of a total transparent society. This is also promoted by these digital uh, heroes. And a total transparent politician, like in the novel uh, The Circle by Dave Eggers, the perfect transparent politician is somebody who is visible in all his thoughts or her thoughts and all actions and all conversations, so the so-called public can control it. If she or he does something that is not really good, he has to be thrown out. So this is a concept, this is totally apolitical. And this is what they say, the whole libertarian ideology is a, an ideology against politics and the politics in itself. And it's something like a perverted kind of rational concept because the claim is that we have all this kind of rational solutions for everyone. Yeah? Yeah. But this is a fascist type of 
societal design. Okay, it's end of politics, it's a totalitarian situation that even skips one of those other universal things that we always refer, it's not that intellectually, not that uh, interesting like, like the concept of fairness or what you mentioned, this universal or generational system of contracts between Übermensch and slaves yep. called parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's the concept of crisis. So the idea of Schmidt and others is finally we will overcome any situation of crisis. There will be no crisis anymore because everything is so. functioning, functioning in a perfect way. Coming from charismatic leaders and our chancellor to the concept of crisis. Um, uh, I mean, every generation is seduced to overestimate their particular situation. So we all say it's crisis since I've been living. It yeah. has always been yeah. one crisis after the other. Yeah. Um, it seems from time to time things are accelerating and we have a crisis in a way of non more functioning uh, political and institutional um, systems in Europe now. And this is what we call the refugee crisis, call it how you like it. But we see some kind of dysfunctionality of our systems yeah. on the European level, um, changed by crisis in this regard too. Yeah. Um, there is a wonderful Austrian uh, thinker, uh, um, Ivan Ilyich, not Lenin, different guy, who said, who said an interesting thing, who was a sociologist, philosopher, anthropologist, theologian, hard to... Priest. Priest also, hard to, hard to social mover in Latin America. Uh, but he had a wonderful observation. He said that modern society has vomited ethics to the outside upon institutions. So uh, to give an example, I no longer have to care for the, for the sick. I have uh, insurance, uh, health insurance that cares for the sick in my stead as if automatically. I don't have to care for the old. I, I can bring them bananas and you know, have lunch with them, but I don't have to essentially rewire my life when my parents retire or when they turn sick, I can live my life pretty much, at least on the technical side, as usual. When I have children, I also, after a couple of months, can live my life uh, as, as, as you, so we have institutions that carry what in the previous decades would be an individual personal responsibility. Which brings me, of course, to the New Testament. If we wouldn't have a New Testament, the refugee crisis wouldn't be a problem because we would solve it somehow. The problem with the refugee crisis is that there is a clash of ethics. One way how to read, if you want to be provocative in these days, one, how, one way how to read the crisis is that, the, you know, love thy neighbor. So the question is, who is my neighbor? Is it a German to German? Is it a Czech to Czech? Because in Czech Republic, like in Germany, we have a social system. So if a Czech breaks a leg, we all pull our money and he or she doesn't have to pay a penny for his operation. In this way, we are not communist, but communitarian. Uh, car insurance, the same thing. You don't have a choice whether you're in. So insurance is an interesting sociological appearance. It's a spontaneous appearance of communitarianism or let me say the, the, the ugly word of communism, spontaneously born out of capitalist society. It is better for a purely egoistic capitalist to have health insurance. So we made it obligatory. And these days, when it comes to really important and essential things in life, birth, death, health, cars, Etc. Um, Etc. Et no, Coca-Cola is is in a way, uh, you know, you get as much as you pay for. But in healthcare and in and car insurance, the basic principle of capitalism is you pay for your own deeds. So, be responsible is broken. I don't pay for my own deeds. If I drive my uh, unicycle, well, that I'm not sure it's not recognized by law yet. But let's just say that I drive my old rusty Skoda into a golden 
Merci Porsche, Porsche. I drive it in, I get out of my car, I say sorry, and bye, <laughs> basically. You know, we can even have coffee, and I, you know, the only thing that I need to apologize to this person who owns this car is, yeah, sorry for a little bit of, but I'm quite sure you have a sec secretary to, 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 to deal that. This would happen 100 years ago, he would probably torture me and my family for the rest of, you know, our lives. So we must also um, be sh certain that um, we leave capitalism to the unimportant things, such as Coca-Cola. In a way, you could also say that Coca-Cola is a communist drink because unlike wine, it's the same for everybody. So the Coke a multi-billionaire is drinking, it's the same Coke this that is, a builder is building. This is not is true. If you have been, ever been to Atlanta, to the Coca-Cola Museum, you, you would archive. know that you have all kinds of culture-specific Coca-Cola. Okay. A Chinese Coca-Cola is not the Coca-Cola you have in the Czech Republic. It's not that you have in Atlanta. Okay, so but 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 all but at least all the rich Chinese have the same church Coke like the yes, poor Chinese, <laughs> unless it's. In or they know that the American Coca-Cola is different, and they import it by themselves to be privileged. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. <laughs> so there's a, even even in Coca-Cola there's polarity. But okay, let me take an, another example. <laughs> iPhone, yeah? You can't really have a different iPhone from, from Bill Gates or from Steve Jobs if he'd be alive. I mean, he can have it coded in gold, but he would be an idiot having it cold, cold, you know, cold in it. Even, even, the, even, the, so, even the, um, the social fabric of a society, if I came here and I showed you, look, my cell phone is gold-plated. <laughs> Who would really be impressed? Most of you would probably think, <laughs> that I'm an idiot, you know, and I would, I would, I would even um, uh, agree with you. So, so what we need to, what we need to, what we need to also distinguish in this debate is that today, more than ever, we have in our societies pretty much more equal access to things like healthcare, to things like. Uh, uh, car insurance and, and, and pensions, etc., than there ever was in, in the history. And also, the things that we do leave to the market, such as Coca-Cola and mobile phones, are becoming more and more um, egalitarian in the way we consume them. So a multi-billionaire, and you know, I'm just repeating my phone, cannot really have much better phone than, than you. But from this communitarian aspect to solidarity, I mean, communitarian, like the insurance model is an interesting it? model because it, it's defined by a certain group yeah. of people yeah. who join a solidari solidarity, it's a circle of solidarity, yes. and it's defined by Nations. others that don't belong yeah. to the same yeah. circle. So what, where would you put the issue of solidarity, even in a global sense? I mean, the, the question that you um, had before was the question about crisis. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and refugees. And refugees. And solidarity. And solidarity, yes. So maybe we can put these things together in one frame of discussion, because uh, talking about the refugee so-called crisis, I would say this is no crisis, because the idea of a crisis is that it is a kind of disruption uh, of uh, continuous development. The, the whole idea of crisis is there's something happening and then we have to repair it and afterwards it continues again. But with this refugee phenomenon, this is not a crisis because this will stay for mm. the whole century. Uh, it's inevitable, so there is never anymore a decrease of the numbers. So this is something where societies of our types were perfectly able to ignore this during the last two, three decades, whatever. Yeah? That there's something like this now so-called crisis coming up. We know the numbers. We knew the numbers of the 60 million uh, refugees on a global scale 10 years ago. This is nothing new about it. And we know that it will be 150 million in 
five years and there will be 300 million in 10 years or something. So this is something, this is not a crisis, is a transformation. Yeah. It is a transformation of the basic conditions how we have to organize our type of society or how to manage the things. And in the morning uh, of this conference, we had um, uh, three interesting sketches, like cartoons of three different types of future societies. One thing was that we have another type of society that takes into respect that we need other modes of distribution on the global level and everything will be mm, a bit difficult, but somehow okay. Yeah. Fair. This is the fair green type of utopian society. The other thing would be a complete disaster, yeah, like everybody fighting with each other about resources and whatever, so a dystopian way. And the third way was the fortress type of society, yeah. Yeah, where people are inside and very well off in the inside, and th the situation for the outside people goes, grows worse and worse and worse. And now we can discuss what would be the most likely uh, outlook of the future. What will happen? Mm. And this is not a future outlook because the practice we do in the moment dealing with a so-called crisis is to keep the people out. Very simple, because we don't want to change the basic assumptions of our way of living, of sharing, of distributing things and whatever. Yeah. And everybody feels totally threatened yeah, because of this number of one million people coming to Europe. And they have reasons to come to Europe. It's not just a stupid idea that somebody goes, oh, let's go to Europe. There are very, very severe and concrete reasons that everybody knows, yeah? Every European inhabitant knows what it means to be a refugee from war. Everybody knows it by their own family history. So, but this is not the point. We have to keep the people out. And this is, of course, a complete stupid concept because it won't work in the long run. It's completely impossible because the numbers will grow and then you will have this all ever more efforts to keep them out and whatever. And on a broader level, it's stupid anyway because social development always had uh, the reason that there was kind of interchange be be between people and others came and somebody left and whatever. Right. So the whole human history is a history of migration. So it's a complete stupid idea to stop migration by preventing people to migrate. Mm. Very, very dumb. Yeah? Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there exactly this is this is the clash with the with the new te because the question when I got so embedded in the, in the in the in the solidarity which we understand that German is a solidarity with German Czech is solidarity with Czechs the question is who is who am I supposed to be solidarity with why this is the the ancient question who is my neighbor you know Jesus said the most important Teaching is love your neighbor like you love yourself. And the Pharisees, you, of course, when you want to destroy some nice idea, you ask for definitions. They ask for, OK, 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 define neighbor. And he said, well, and he gave the, the story about the, uh, the Samaritan helping, uh, helping this, this man. So, so isn't the problem today now that we don't have, again, the to me, crisis is something that you don't have an answer to. Yes, and until you find the answer, the events in history will always be interpreted as a crisis. So, um, so the question is, who is my neighbor now? Isn't one way to look at the situation is that the neighbor, the fictional idea of this neighbor whom we are to love, wants to be a neighbor, like a real one, not a fictional, distant neighbor. In German, the nera. Is, is too near. Bližní je příliš blízko. It's much better to have your uh, bližní's not so blízko. You know. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah, it, yeah. it works in 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 in, in good jokes always work in in in, in multiplicity of, of languages. So we have this uh, this 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 clash. If it wouldn't be for a New Testament, there wouldn't be a crisis. We would build Fortress Europe. <laughs> this is us. By the way, this is the this is Jeremy Rifkin, a, a man who wrote a, actually a very interesting book about the fourth industrial revolution. He also wrote a book about empathic civilization, in which he has an interesting observation. This is the first time in history that we give a care about some nation there. All the time, we Europeans, the only thing we cared if there was another nation that wasn't us for them to be very quickly destroyed and disappear in, 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 in the remnants of history. We never cared about the Greeks. We never cared about Syrians. And if we did, it was a care in, in the negative sense of the word in terms of exploitation. Now we actually care. We don't know what to do with it. We, we can't politicize it. We can't bureaucratize it. But even, even, even the most radical riots in the street they always make sure that, you know, we, we, we want to help those who need to be helped, but, you know, this is the classical, I'm not a racist, but. <laughs> yeah. um, so this, I think, is, 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 this, I think, is the, the it's, it's an internal structure. This is why I started with, with um, Ivan Ilyich. It's an internal conflict. You yourself don't know what to do with it. How should the politics know? what to do with it. It's, it's a blame that no longer rests in me. It's a blame that rests with the pension system model, or a blame that rests with some institution um, that, uh, that is supposed to solve the moral problem for you in your stead. And my last sentence is, as you said, intellectuals always view the world as a crisis. Coming back to the New Testament, I mean, you read it, that was absolutely the end of the world. It was a crisis, you know, the Lord is coming again, we are living at the end times, and any single intellectual you read since then till today always believe that we live in um, a crisis period. The interesting thing is that you always interpret the crisis in the ideology of the most strongest fetish of the age. So in the New Testament it was a moral crisis, because people believed in morals. Today, it's an economic crisis, because economics has become such an interesting or strong fetish. Interesting aspect added to our discussion, the, the paradigm of security and uncertainty. Um, the f surprising event in Germany last year was that our chancellor shifted from, from the ever expected paradigm of security, I tell you how I will do it, until, uh, to, a, to a mode of unsecurity. We have to do it, we can do it, but I don't know yet how we can do it. How much, uh, uh, how much unsecurity is allowed if you are a politician? Yeah, obviously, obviously none. Uh, because th this is the discussion we have now in Germany, and it's a very depressing discussion we have now because th this position that uh, uh, Angela Merkel took in the late summer uh, last year to say it is our obligation to take these people and it's no problem, wir schaffen das, we can make it, is now completely weakened. Uh, even by the members of her own party and whatever, so there's something like a... Even by herself, I think. Uh, maybe a maybe long, long now thing, yeah. even by herself, but, yeah. but she was surprisingly, she was very, um, very stark uh, a few months against all these other uh, persons to say something neutral. Um, and now there's something going on, like the, what I would call something like the European hysteria, uh, that something is happening here that these type of society is unable to cope with. This is completely ridiculous. Um, I did, forgot what the question was. Unsecurity. Uh, unsecurity, yeah, so, and the, the this is, we had this, this point before, that the, um, the stupid idea of politics should be 
that they can manage everything for the population of a given society. This is completely wrong, misleading, and it was never thought of that politics and, uh, and um, uh, society should be like this. I mean, human existence was never about problem solving. We always have, during 300,000 years of human history, we have millions of problems especially problems of inequality, of overpowering people, of robbing people, whatever. Constant problems. But what was possible to achieve, at least in some parts of the world, was um, a lowering of these problems. Yeah. Human problems are not problems that can be solved. This is very simple because there are always new humans and there are always new circumstances. So basic problems stay but we have civilizatory modes to cope with these problems better or worse. And therefore, I wanted to, to correct something or to criticize something what you said, because there are few people um, who thought differently about societal development, not in terms of crisis. Uh, for example, the German philosopher Odo Marquardt, who died last year, his uh, central sentence is, it is more non-crisis than crisis. And this is a very important thing because in the moment as we talk, we have an extremely comfortable situation here. It's very good. There's this beautiful institute with this beautiful director of this institute offering <laughs> us this situation here. And we can, yeah, the highly civilized uh, situation and whatever. So this is absolutely non-crisis. Yeah, there's something critical outside somewhere, but the most things work in our societies Absolutely. in the moment. Yeah. Absolutely. And they did even work during the financial crisis. Yeah. Yeah. This was also more, so maybe we, sometimes we have to, to um, switch uh, the position a little bit. And the other one was, was Norbert Elias with a theory uh, of the civilization process. And this is also kind of interesting because I think in the civilization process during history, some progress was made. We have another, um, another position towards violence. We have another concept of childhood. We have other ideas, how, what is okay to treat a child and what not. We have other relationship between men and women and whatever. So yep. many things we have. Although it is not sufficient, we have lowered the rates of people who starve in the world, although the population is growing, things like that. So some things work, and it's much more interesting, I think, from my point of view, to figure out what works, yeah? And, uh, and uh, if at least not to be hysterical, yeah? yeah? I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, if we wouldn't read media, none of you would have been affected by the financial crisis. <laughs> None of you would have been affected by the migrant crisis. None of you would have been affected by the Ukrainian crisis. None of you would have been affected by the Greek crisis. It's all absolutely, uh, uh, I don't know, I want to say fictional, but it's, it's um, I once had a dream that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that there was a war on the internet. This was the time when Second Life, if you remember Second Life, you had your avatar, your fictional character, in a fictional space of internet. And there started a war on, in internet, and then people actually got so angry that you killed my grandmother in the abstract world of the Second Life. I really find you, I find your address, and I, I don't know, I kill your dog or something. Or, or. So that the real war would it's an allegory on the Thomas theorem, of course, but I think it's a nice image that a real war would start from fictional, abstract, uh, entertainment-based, if you, if, I'm, I don't want to be too brutal, but, but in this case of my example, entertainment-based uh, level that's absolutely fictional, 100% fictional, but it is defined as real, and it thus becomes real in its consequences. And a real war could start out of that, the end of a dream. Fast forward till today, what's the difference? It, the situation could be 
uh, uh, likened to, to, to something like that. It is not really the refugees, because there's you know, not really a single, single one here in the Czech Republic or in many other countries. It's, again, some sort of a fear. And this, this and again, you are a much better expert in this than me, but it seems all the anti-Semitism and all, all the fears that we have, even gender fears, have in them, I th and you can see this nicely with the refugees as well, have an inbuilt paradox, which I have observed, again, I might be wrong, it's just a provocative way of looking at things so that it brings something else than stereotypes. Let's take anti-Semitism. The fear is paradoxically double. A, they are too weak, and B, they are too strong. And this you have with, uh, with the gender fear of male fear of women. They are too weak, we need to protect them, we need to shelter them, but on the other hand, they actually control our whole lives because we run around like they whistle. <laughs> and the similar aspect you can see with the refugee wave. They are too, again, I'm just describing a stereotype, not to be misunderstood. They are too backwards, they are too, they're, 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 their customs are too barbarian. Of course, they're too barbarian because it's exactly what we used to do 200 years ago. That's one of the fears that, that the history, and you started nicely. This is actually about progress, right? This is the biggest fear that the toilet starts flashing backwards. <laughs> that history, you know, this is, this is also something that Ivan Illich described. You know, we live in a beautiful, clean, environment exactly because our whole cities are are prospikovani <laughs> are uh, the yeah they are we are omnipresently cannibalized can not cannibalized but anyway <laughs> Ugh. Okay, you know, and uh, that was a slip of a freudian slip of time not ca yeah. not cannibalized but ca uh, canalized we are imme we are constantly being washed away our Leftovers from our bodies are constantly being washed away into the place where we don't see them, smell them, hear them, know where they go. We don't really know. It's, it used to be us. Five minutes ago, you would die for it, and then suddenly you don't want to see. And the fear, the most subliminal psychological fear, is that this process of self cleaning gets reversed. And this is something <clears throat> that you see in anti-Semitism, and you see it also a little bit in this fear of, 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 this, of this new wave, is, oh my God, we did that even worse, and it's coming back. Um, future, as you said, this is not a crisis, this is perhaps a trend. We fear that the trend is going to destroy us. Ironically, we have the same fear towards technologies as well. On one hand, we see the technology will be a solution to the problems created by technology. This is one of the ecological hopes of the green growth movement, of which I'm also not critical but cynical. <laughs> I think that works better. Uh, <clears throat> but we, we, on the one hand, we, we see technology and progress as a solution to the problems created by technology and progress. But on the other hand, we of course extremely fear it, and, 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 and these, these fears are also in a way legitimate. So it's, it's the double fear of becoming too animal-like, too barbarian, too populist, too unculturally fulfilling immediately my libidal desires of coke, sex, violence, or, or whatnot. That's one fear that we will revert back to, let's say, animalism. And the other fear is that we will become too much rational, too much robot-like, that technologies, or that we will come to the situation where we will deem it better for ourselves that technologies, for example, make our consumer and even political, political decisions. I think this is the, the, the struggle of man, humankind, that we are between an animal and a robot, between something that's too emotional and irrational, and something that's too rational and too unemotional. If you look at the horror genre, which you've probably guessed is one of my favorite, most of the horror figures come from a combination of a human being and an animal. 
vampires, zombies, even children. They're not yet fully cultured. They're not yet fully devils, horns. Uh, so that's one fear. And the other fear is that we will be consumed by Matrix, Welsh, the Clash of the Worlds, uh, artificial intelligence, of us being too rational, too economic. And I think that this is the eternal struggle of humankind is to somehow stay in the middle, which is, of course, impossible. This is why I don't believe in such thing as psychological even space. I would say, together with Freud, that the, the, that the very essence of the psychological space-time continuum is disturbed. It's impossible to, to uh, or I don't believe in, 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 in a smooth psychological landscape. All right, uh, one last remark maybe from horror to this universal category of fear that has been mentioned. Change, transformation driven by fear. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, fear is, of course, a driver of, of change and transformation, but uh, with, with bad results. Uh, because fear is never something where people, people who experience fear, who are anxious, have a narrow scope of thinking and acting, because it's highly reactive. If you, are, if you do something because you're afraid, yeah? you have only va one variable that drives you. If you have no fear, you have a much broader room to maneuver, a much broader perception of what is going on. So, and this is the reason why fear is always capitalized and instrumentalized by, by people who are interested to, uh, to do something with it. And it's, of course, uh, um, this is also something that reappears in history all the time, that capitalizing fear is something very beautiful to accumulate power about people. Yeah. And this, and then we are again at the, with the Thomas theorem, because this fear can be as weird and yeah. irrational as you can ever think of, yeah. but it works, it works. Anti-Semitism works without Jews. This is the most, in, yeah, this is the most interesting thing. And if you look to Germany, to this stupid Pegida phenomenon, yeah, this fear of Muslims developed in an area of Germany where there's not a single Muslim around, not a single one. Yeah? This is really interesting. It's a local phenomenon. And um, yeah. Can I say a joke? Yes, of course. <laughs> Niels Bohr was, uh, I think. Oh, this, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Well. I think this will, this will fit now. <laughs> this is a good one. Do you know the joke? <laughs> so, Niels Bohr, a man of science, invites his friends to his uh, summer house. And uh, they come there and they see that there's a horseshoe on the door of his uh, cottage cabin. And they say, oh, but. Um, we saw that you are a man of science, that you know you don't believe in these, you know, superstitions. superstitions. And he says, yeah, 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 of course I don't believe it, but it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, 90, more than 90 min minutes are over. I'm sure there will be some questions. I'd suggest that we take in some three or four very short questions or remarks. And we give and no one, answers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we have a last round to wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Voices, microphone, questions, remarks, short, please. We have a microphone, some, yeah. We have a microphone, but no questions. <laughs> There's one. I would be quite interested how you consider the individual in this whole game, because I think it's all about, um, what you mentioned now, it was all about societies, communities, but what about self-confidence of an individual and the, his or her able, ability to decide? The next question. No questions, beautiful, good. Uh, <laughs> you need Maybe mic. you can. <laughs> I would like just uh, to ask you to develop on the idea that 
the reality is developing from the ideological world yeah. by just uh, giving an example. If I cannot find anything on Google, that means it doesn't exist. Yeah, okay, so that's a good, uh, perfect. Maybe I could even connect these two, or do we want to get a, get a third one? Okay. Two questions. Um, Who would like to start? So, it all, of course, depends on the individual. Politics is just a reflect. I mean, you will all go home and you'll think about other things the moment this thing, and that's okay. This is why, this is why, this is why we do this. The personal interpretation, I mean, if you'd be not interested in these things, if you'd be, I don't know what, selling coffee in the next shop and your problem would be, I don't know, the color of your shoes, that's the world that you will live in. You chose to problematize your world with topics that were under subject, so this will be your blessing and your curse for the rest of your life. I always say that complicated people will live complicated lives because they like it that way. Simple people, and I'm not saying stupid people, you can have highly intelligent people who are simple, who see point A and point B and they try to find the nearest path. Si not like us, right? <laughs> simple people will try to simplify their lives and they will live as simple lives as they can, which is fine. Simple doesn't mean stupid. Simple is, you know, simple. Simple is good for some, you know. It's complicated people, such as philosophers, will live complicated lives. And the moment your lives will be simple, you'll be miserable, I think. Uh, but anyway, this is, of course, personal <laughs> psychoanalysis on, it's a, a pornography uh, of, of a different kind. The Google example is a great example now. Can Google be, is there such a thing as non-ideological objective information? No, not even on Google. If I had more time, I would give an example, but we don't, so I'll just do a quick one. When you type the word black in your Google, what should come out? Should it be a black painting? Or should it be a physical definition of color black? Or should it be a song by Rolling Stones? Or should it be a, a picture of the night sky? Or should it be um, a, a, a depressive state that psychology? Or should it be a symbol of evil? In most cultures, this is, this is so. What should it be? Uh, if, now, if you would type the word Google, I mean, if you, would type, if you type the word Google into Google, you destroy the internet, right? You don't do that. Uh, uh, but if you type the word black into Google, what should come out and what actually does come out? A collective prejudice or collective understanding. Now, with the word black, that's easy to see, and it's a nice example, what's funny. Now, instead of black, let's try and type the word Jew or Muslim into Google. Now, who determines or what determines? It's also actually, you could look at it as an extremely democratic process, but not without prejudices. You type the word refugee. Now, will you get a nice image of, uh, like, you know, here playing national instruments and, you know, eating local food and being very happy that we can understand each other and, you know, hallelujah, we are, you know, all one great humankind. Or will you get a nasty picture of somebody, uh, you know, cutting somebody else's head off? This is crucially determinate to a newcomer. Let's say that I want to find objective information. I want to orient myself in this complex world. I want to reduce complexity. So I do my proper, as we all should, we educated intellectuals, we should also you know, do our own research. So I come back home and I type the word refugee, for example, or technology, whatever. You will get bias. It will be the most democratic bias and the most objective bias that you can have, you know, in mathematics we have the smallest infinity, it has a name. So this would be the most objective, but nevertheless bias that you, that, 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 that you can get. After a while you'll get sick and tired of it and you'll reduce to an immediate charismatic 
leader standing next to you chanting something that makes immediate sense. So this could be, this is another phenomenon of today. We don't have a problem with the freedom of the word or freedom of speech. This is no issue. You can say whatever you want. It will be drowned in, in, in the mass uh, voices of, of, of everyone. So this is a new, I think, phenomenon for, for the philosophers. Not only is there no ideologically neutral ground, there is also no information uh, neutral ground, as I tried to show with this example from, from Google, which I don't think you can ever get. In the past days, you looked up the word refugee in Encyclopedia Britannica, and what you got was a bias of educated, not elected, but somehow academically processed men, the most esteemed men with lots of time, get to do encyclopedias. So you would get your understanding what a Muslim is, or a Jew is, or a Christian is, from from the opinion of, let's say, maybe 12 men and, and women. Now it's more democratic, I would say better, but still not without, without bias. So every Google search you do, every link you click, actually influences the next search for the next generation. Which is the difference to the British Encyclopedia? Because right. this was then an information that stayed independently of the fact who many people, how many people would take this information. And this is really a difference because we have this kind of, you know, redundant self-feeding process Circle. that does something with, with our knowledge, with our information and yep. with our self. And this is, I think, the, the point where the individual comes into play. And it's true that we didn't talk much about the individual directly, but indirectly I think we did. Because individual is a historically spoken recent concept. And we have not the idea of an individual in the Middle Ages or in ancient uh, um, ages. Uh, this is relatively new. And it's dependent on a societal type where you need people who can decide about, about certain things. Uh, if you have something like an industrial uh, um, society and a complicated economy, you need persons who would be able to decide autonomously about this and that. If you make businesses, you have to do this. If you have to educate people, you have to be capable of making decisions on your own. So this is a requirement of modern societies. And as we live in modern, demo still democratic societies with a legal framework, individuals still make a difference in the moment. This is, I think, a very crucial point, also going back to the discussion we had on the conference today, because what an individual does <coughs> makes a difference because our societies are designed that individuals make a difference. Yeah, they can elect, they can make their signs somewhere, they can organize themselves, they can uh, invent initiatives for this and that, they can make discussions yeah. and so. Therefore, individuals absolutely matter. Yeah? It's not about structures and societies and all those abstract concepts. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's good that you brought up this point uh, in the very end of our debate. May I, may, may I also perhaps just one short point. Every individual voice counts, but when, the ev but when every individual voice actually counts, like with the Florida recount between Bush and yeah. um, Al Gore, it becomes ridiculous. Yeah. Because it shouldn't be one person deciding whether the whole world will be led by Al Gore or by Bush. <laughs> but that's the, the, that's the way the cookie crumbles. It should be, you know. So there's also a little bit of, of irony in that. OK, we've learned that change takes place, whatever we do. The question is how a world population of 9 or 10 billion comes through this century within societies that guarantee, let's say, a minimum of liberty and a fair share of essential resources. If you want to get inspired how we could make this, please 
look at the Future Perfect website. You find stories of individuals, of groups, of people who already begun what has to be done. If you want to know more about the activities of the Goethe Institute within the next week, go on our website. Uh, I want to thank my both uh, of you. Um, it was a pleasure to having you here. Um, danke schön. Gerne. Nasledano. Gerne. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet such wonderful minds. I really am honored. Okay. So you can all go now. <laughs> <laughs>